you should be getting two mails actually you get one auto mail from uh, YouTube okay and then you get a manual mail from me so in case the YouTube link doesn't work click the manual mail the link that is there in the manual mail that you get from me so everyone double A you had a problem earlier with your access here are you able to see it now okay please make sure you check all this don't come to me like two days before the exam saying I can't see any other videos you're supposed to be doing your uh, uh, you know getting ready from now itself making sure you can access the videos all right okay so let's quickly go through the correct answers for your CP questions okay as I said poor way of poor, poor performance the the article you have the article given to you the CNBC article I'm gonna make you read uh, where is that article Okay, so this was explained just a few days ago and yet I don't think anyone answered this correctly. Not a single person answered this correctly. So placing an order, the correct definition of spoofing will be uh, placing an order without the intention to have it executed okay or without the intention to uh, allow it to be executed normally you would assume that when a person places an order he obviously intends for it to be executed but this is specifically when actually if you look yeah when they do these convictions like when they convicted this Indian uh, trader Narendra Sarao how did they prove it because he was doing algorithmic trading okay remember this is HFT so HFT necessarily has to be done algorithmically okay because a human being can't trade at such a high speed so you can see in your algos itself the program code when you look at the program code you will see that the code already provides for the cancellation of the order so it's not like okay I, I thought I would cancel the order you have already coded it into your program that these orders will be placed and as the price reaches near that order they will be cancelled or for some other when some other condition is met the order will be cancelled is this clear okay all right so spoofing specifically is placing an order without the intended uh, intention to have it executed basically to fool the market right to deceive the market and layering is just multiple cases of spoofing at multiple price at various different prices okay i don't know why nobody got this right because this was discussed just a few days ago all right next next question standard financial market definition of a recession some of you got this right but your answering again is not very uh, proper uh, some of you are saying economy and GDP GDP is a specific measure of economic performance okay GDP growth changes in GDP okay quarter to quarter or year to year changes in GDP that's a specific measure of economic performance you can also look at inflation etc so the correct answer is the two consecutive quarters of GDP contraction okay so some people said GDP falling down and all that that's not the way a finance student should be answering you just say contraction GDP contraction or negative we don't like to say negative growth because negative growth is like a kind of an oxymoron okay growth normally implies positive movement okay so we therefore we use the word GDP contraction okay another name for a yield curve is term structure of interest rates this must have been discussed at least three or four times the term structure is a standard for many cases of uh, is a standard expression for many cases of um, what type of data in finance terms uh, cross-sectional or time series cross-sectional cross okay many instances of cross-sectional data in finance they are uh, described as term structure of this term structure of that etc okay so nobody got this right amazing 
Okay, in commodity markets, again, your answering is highly improper. Many of you at least remember that contango means upward sloping and backwardation means uh, downward sloping. Now, see how sloppy your answering is because many of you said when the yield curve is upward sloping, the yield curve, the expression yield curve is used in which asset class? <laughs> One minute. What do you say? Finance. Finance. The, the expression. Yeah. So that's the right answer. When I ask you, the expression yield curve is used in which asset class is it used? Is it used? And that is the answer is debt. The yield curve expression is only used in the asset class that we refer to as debt, not in equities, not in commodities. Okay. So therefore, when the question itself is asking you commodity markets in commodity markets, these terms are only used in commodity markets. So the question is asking you in commodity markets what are contango and backwardation? Why are people saying when the yield curve is upward sloping? The expression yield curve has no place in commodity markets. Okay, it's a debt market expression. Okay, so that's the first case of sloppy answering. So that's not how it should be answered. In commodity markets, you can go back and read in your notes the definition. Again, the right way to answer this question is that when what are contango and backwardation? When the term structure of forward stroke futures prices. You can look at either type of price because remember forwards and futures are very similar. Economically, they are very similar. So the correct answer is that's why this uh, you know question has uh, six marks each. So the term structure is a key word that we are looking for. Term structure of forward and futures, forward stroke futures prices. Either of them could be referred to. Okay. So term structure of forward stroke futures prices. That's the second component of the answer. And the third component is in the case of contango, you say it's upward sloping. And in this case of backwardation, you say it's downward sloping. This is how the answer should be given. Okay. And many people are saying upward sloping, so the price yield curve is upward sloping, so the prices are rising. How can prices be rising if uh, yield curve is what terms uh, is uh, no any yield, yield curve or even if you refer to yield curve, okay, they use the expression yield curve, which is not correct in this context. But in any case. If it's a yield curve, what is it? Time series data or cross sectional data? Cross sectional data. So in cross sectional data, how can you ever say that prices are rising? Prices are rising means it's like GABA is climbing up the stairs. I mean, there's movement. You take a snapshot at one point, you see it on stair one. After a few minutes, you see it on stair five. <coughs> so when you talk, you should be aware of what you're saying. If a yield curve is cross is uh, cross sectional data, how can you say prices are rising? You can never detect anything moving in cross-sectional data. It's only a snapshot at a point of time. Is this clear? <coughs> okay, so total disaster. The performance in CP is total disaster. Questions are very simple, very easy. It just shows that people are not paying attention. They're sitting in front and talking. <coughs> Okay, so <clears throat> while I while I just try to drink some water, I have given you a link. Watch this video for a while. Copper prices actually. So <clears throat> maybe you can study this. I've given you a couple of video links. <clears throat> okay, so what does this mean? Is this a supply deficit or a is the demand? What are they projecting going into the future? This kind of a thing shows you how fundamental analysis is done in commodities. Okay, so they have given you a couple of videos uh, linked to in your in your uh, in that sheet that we use as a daily daily tracker. Okay, session outline in that file. So this one snapshot at the beginning of this video, they're interviewing one of the metals company CEOs, okay? Because this LME, actually this is LME week in London right now, so if you look into the Bloomberg, you'll see lots of metals company CEOs being interviewed, okay? Because there's a LME week going on in London right now. Because London is a big center for metals trading also. Yes. Not just precious metals, but also what we call base metals, okay? LME is London Metal Exchange. So the LME is a, London, uh, is a London metal exchange, but right now it's actually currently owned by HKEX, which is a Hong Kong exchanges and clearing. So the, these com the Hong Kong company has actually bought over this company, but they keep it as LME because the brand name remains. <coughs> okay, 
So this, what does this show? This is a deficit or I mean, is supply going to exceed demand or uh, demand is going to exceed supply in the future in 2024, 25? Supply is going to exceed supply. Demand is exceeding supply. What does the word say? Severe deficits. Severe deficits, which means essentially supply deficit. They are projecting a supply deficit. So if you look at the fundamental analysis, so one of the things that you're supposed to do in your project, one of the goals in the project is why do we make you track these commodities? Because these are global commodities, copper, oil, and what is the third one? Uh, gold, okay? All these are global commodities, okay? So if you develop expertise in tracking these commodities, that is a globe, that is a skill that is valuable around the world, okay? That is, that is value around the world. So these are global commodities and copper is very important for, I mean, it is very, it's a very cyclical commodity. It is tied to global growth cycles, etc. All right, <clears throat> so you can get from this kind of a picture, you can get a sense of, you have some idea about FA and TA, right? So you can get a sense of what kind of analysis people do when they do FA analysis. Okay, this is where, where FA basically. So this is where they're projecting the supply demand. So obviously they're gonna come out with, so their view on copper is gonna be what, bullish or bearish? Bullish. Bullish, right? Because they're projecting severe supply deficits, okay? So excess demand. It's an excess demand situation. So they are fundamentals. If you listen to the discussion now, everybody's bullish. So you listen to this guy's interview. I'm going to, I'm not going to play it now anymore. I'm just going to put it into your um, <clears throat> into your sheet. And there's also another interview with. Uh, I'll just explain that. Okay, I think, uh, okay, I'm just gonna put this. So the other interview that you have, so I've given you the second link here, I'll just put a little line in between. Rio Tinto is a very, have you guys heard of Rio Tinto? It's a, actually Anglo-Australian company. It's a very big, very old and big uh, name in metals. Okay, it's a mining company. So this kind of uh, magma resources case that you're doing, this could also be Rio Tinto, okay? That's a typical kind of company that this case is based on. So you can listen to them talking about aluminium. This discussion is mostly on aluminium, so it doesn't really, but you still get a feel for uh, how metals are discussed, okay? What is the supply situation? You get a feel for this. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this this stuff, is this is just for your reference. So you can listen to this. It'll give you a feel for what's going on in the markets. So where are we now? We have two. Yeah, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go through the rest of the case. So we'll just quickly cover the rest of the material that is, uh, we'll cover this technical note, we want to finish the technical note, the discussion. So this is where we were yesterday. This is like a taxonomy, like if you see on that, if you look at that uh, screen there on, uh, on the top, on the top left, uh, on the left hand side, the left hand wall. So that is your taxonomy of asset classes, markets and instruments, okay. So what you're seeing in front on the projector is this is a taxonomy of risk, okay. So when you look at the different types of risk. Uh, these are the types of risks that you have. We've already discussed most of these things. Okay, so in most other taxonomies, you'll see most of these areas, this, this numbering system is not correct. Um, Okay, so in most other, if you look at a book on risk management, you might find a similar taxonomy. The term that you may not find is a third one, financing risk. Sometimes people might leave out this type of risk and sometimes they may refer to it as liquidity risk. So you'll hear some other taxonomy in which uh, you might find this kind of thing uh, as we refer to as uh, liquidity risk. So I've made it more specific and I've called it financing risk, okay? 
so all this stuff you're already familiar with most of this stuff okay so when we looked at that uh, example Okay, so this example that we are looking at, when we when we look at this balance sheet and we are looking at any of these key risk factors, which is your gold, the gold price, the copper price, the West Texas, uh, the dollar yen rate, the Aussie dollar rate, and as well as the three month LIBOR. Okay, when you are looking at the potential losses that this company might have, okay, the potential losses that this company might suffer as a consequence of changes in these rates. Okay, what you saw. In the well, yesterday when we went to the ending balance sheet page, yes. you saw that there was a big loss of 18 million dollars. Okay, so that loss is entirely a manifestation of market risk. So we, we are still discussing the risk taxonomy. So your market risk, credit risk, financing risk, legal, regulatory, and operational risk. So what you saw yesterday, the scenario analysis that we did, that when it went from a starting balance sheet net worth of 48 down to 30 something in this ending balance sheet. That is completely due to market risk, the manifestation of market risk. Okay, so if you have this balance sheet, you already have the risk. But when the risk actually materializes and you lose money, then you say that the there is a manifestation of market risk or the materialization of market risk. Okay, or any other type of risk. Is this clear to everyone? So market risk and credit risk are the two most important types of risks. I mean, most common. That is why where most people lose a lot of money. Or operational risk also, you can lose very large sums of money. And uh, so, but uh, mainly we focus on the the more technical discussions are on market risk and credit risk. Okay, measurement of market risk and credit risk. Okay, so when you look at market risk, so when you go back to that spreadsheet that, that uh, on the left hand wall, on the left hand wall, the taxonomy of asset classes, markets, and instruments. So when you are looking at market risk, typically what you're going to do is the market risk is very complicated. Okay, it's very complex when you're looking at a large bank or a large uh, commodity trading company. Typically, you'll have a very complex uh, structure of market risks. So the way to understand market first, the way to do risk analysis for a large company is first to break down the risks into that taxonomy. Okay, so you break down the risks into, okay, these are the legal regulatory risks, these are the uh, op operational risks, okay, these are the credit risks, these are the market risks. And when you go into the market risk, yeah, first you apply the broad taxonomy of risk. And second, then you have to start, you have to then marry this framework into the market risk. Okay, when you look at a further detailed uh, examination of market risk, when you're doing a detailed examination of market risk, you have to look at this framework here, the asset classes, markets, and instruments framework. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to basically. Uh, so he's correct. So you have to then move on to when you're doing a detailed examination of market risk. You have to then move on to this kind of a framework where you would look at market risk by each for each asset class. Okay. First, you would look at a market risk for each asset class, and then within each asset class, you would go market and market by market and instrument combination. So, if you're looking at, let's say, within uh, market risk, you look at you start looking at uh, different asset classes. You look at you start looking by you start by looking at currency risk. Okay, you start by looking at currency risk, and then in currency risk, you see that you have risk in dollar yen and Aussie dollars. Okay, so then you understand that your exposure is actually to the forward dollar yen rate because the loan has to be repaid in the future but for our trading purposes in the risk management project we are going to treat it as the spot dollar yen which will be rolled over regularly but technically in your project if you would if you look at your actual balance sheet that you're looking at there you have two currencies where you have ex where you have exposure to risk dollar yen. aussie dollar and yen okay so what you have typically how would you place it first you start by looking at currency risk within market risk and then you see that it goes under currencies and it goes under forwards okay so it is at the intersection of forwards and currencies 
Okay, so you see that you have forward ex uh, forward foreign exchange exposure, and which are the markets within currencies where you have it is in Aussie dollar and dollar yen. Is this clear? Yes. Is everyone following how you look at market risk? How you do a risk analysis? Okay, and the same thing follows. So if you had a, if I could construct an even more complicated balance sheet. Now, if we go back to this itself, when we go back to this itself, we can go back to this balance sheet. All right. So on the currency side, if you look at the market risk on this balance sheet, so what we're doing right now is we are taking the theory that we learned about the proper taxonomy of risks, okay? And we also uh, and we also learned earlier the theory about the proper taxonomy of asset classes, markets, and instruments, okay? Which is on that wall there. So that we are marrying these two theoretical frameworks and we are applying it to this balance sheet and to understand to understand how risk analysis would be done, okay? So if you have to give a risk report to the board, let's say if you're giving, if you're the risk manager or the treasurer of the company, and if you're giving a risk analysis report to the board, this is how would you would present the report, okay? You would say, yeah, this would be the structure of the report, okay? So you would go by first the taxonomy of risks, you will say that this company faces these types of risks, maybe you're currently trading with Iran, and then the US has imposed sanctions. So if you don't stop your all your transactions, if you don't finish them by November, then you could face sanctions, okay, from the U.S. Treasury. So that would be a legal, that would be a regulated uh, legal risk, okay. So that that's how you would lay out the presentation. First, classify all the large risk uh, by looking at large, by risks by looking at by applying that risk taxonomy framework, market risk, credit risk, etc. Then delve deeper into market risk by going by each asset class, by going by each asset class, and then looking at the market instrument combination. So in this case. When you go into currencies, forward. yeah, so forward and uh, the two markets. Okay, so that's the market instrument combination. Okay, so then you would say first we look at currency risk. We see we have dollar yen and for an Aussie dollar. So we have exposure to uh, FX forwards, FX forwards rates for Aussie dollar and dollar yen. Okay, so it's a combination of crossing of currencies on the row side and forwards on the column side on that wall. Okay. You can't see, but you remember the framework. Like Jada, there cannot. You can't read the things there, but you remember that framework, right? We have those. Uh, uh, okay. So then, what would what would you do further on this balance sheet when you're looking at further examination of market risk? You would look at this. Okay. Look at the look at the commodity side. So then, once again, you come back to this framework. Then you pay a zero in on the asset class that is called commodities. Okay. So you go to the commodities row. And then we are assuming that we will treat these as spot market exposures. So then it will be at the intersection of commodities and spot. Are you following this? Remember what I told you that whenever you're looking at prices in any market, okay, whenever you're looking at prices in any market, it will have to be the prices for one of these instruments. You cannot see any market price unless it is the price of one of these instruments. It will be either forwards, futures, whatever it is. Just like I showed you wild futures. I showed you the oil futures curve. Okay, there you're looking at oil market prices, but those are all futures prices. Okay, these are all they are not forward prices or they are not options prices. They are all futures prices. So whenever you look at market prices, it's the price of some instrument or the other. Okay, so the only instrument that is left out there in that framework is CFDs. Okay, which is what you're trading in your Rwanda platform. These are contracts for difference. Have I explained this before? Did I discuss this before with you? Okay, briefly I discussed it. Yeah, so contract for difference, Canada, France, Denmark, okay, CFD, okay. So contracts for difference I've left out, they are very similar to futures in that there is a daily mark to market and a daily settlement of profits and losses. The reason I've left it out from the framework is that CFDs are actually a retail instrument. Institutional traders don't, don't use CFDs, okay, unless they're selling it to retail customers. So between the, in the wholesale market, nobody trades CFDs. That is Bank of America trading with uh, Citibank, they will not be trading in CFDs. Okay, what they trade is either futures or forwards. Okay, so because uh, we are teaching you finance from an institutional perspective, so I've not prioritized CFDs. But in technically, you can read futures stroke CFDs. In that framework, you can read it as futures stroke CFD. I'll, maybe I'll put a footnote later on. Okay, so CFDs are contracts for difference, and the Oanda platform that you are using when you trade these products, this crude oil, uh, copper, etc., what you're going to trade in your project you are actually going to be trading in CFDs. Okay, that's the instrument you are using because this is a retail platform. Oanda is a retail platform. Okay, 
So that's, you're actually going to be using CFDs, but it's exactly the same as futures. There's daily market to market settlement of profit and loss every day. And uh, it's just there is some, you see that there's a financing charge involved, okay? So in this case, what we would say is that your exposure is for all these three commodities. So when we look at, when we're doing a risk analysis or a risk presentation, we will say that as far as uh, commodities is concerned, as we move through the asset classes, uh, as far as commodities is concerned, we are, uh, commodities are concerned. So we will say that we have exposure in gold. We are exposed to spot prices in gold, copper and oil. And then you would explain all these underlying positions. You would say that in, co in all these cases, you would have to, even in the previous case where I forgot to mention that, that when you're discussing the dollar yen and Aussie dollar exposure, you would also mention the order underlying exposure. Okay, so you would say that we are long or short Aussie dollars or long or short dollar yen. So here again, in the commodities case, you will say that we are exposed to spot prices in gold, copper and West Texas oil and our underlying positions in all these is long. Okay, this is how we would explain the risks on this balance sheet. Okay, and then when you come to interest, uh, when you come to three month dollar LIBOR, what asset class is that? Debt. debt. Okay. So that is debt. So then you move on back in the framework. You move down to debt. You can't see that debt here because it's covered. It's uh, it's, it's underneath. Okay. So uh, then you move on to this framework and say that okay, in debt. In Oanda, you can't manage this risk. But in real life, when you are facing a situation, you will have a platform to manage this risk. Okay. You will be trading in a platform using like TWS or something where you can manage this risk. Okay. Is everyone following so far? Okay, so then you would say that you move on to the uh, asset class that is called debt and you say that within that debt asset class we have exposure to three month US dollar LIBOR. Okay, and we are short, uh, three, our underlying position is short. Okay, so we will lose money if uh, three month dollar LIBOR rises. Okay, is everything clear now? Is this clear now how you would apply both the taxonomy that you learned earlier with respect to asset classes? Okay, and also this risk taxonomy that, you, uh, that you've seen just now. Is this clear how this can be used in a real life situation? Yes. When you make a presentation, like a CFO is making a presentation to the board on the risks facing the company. Is this clear? Okay. And then of course you will talk further about what is your plan for managing the risk, etc. What are your views on the current market? Okay, so here I've introduced a new term, okay, which is new for you guys and I've developed a little bit of taxonomy with. So it sounds very complicated, but it's actually simpler than it sounds, okay. Let's start with an example so that maybe it's easier for you to understand instead of looking at the theory. Now this is what we are, the term we are discussing is a risk book, okay. So if you look into any, if you walk into any trading room, Okay, or a corporate treasury. Everyone, your yeah, people will be familiar with this expression called a risk book. Okay, so typically when you are actually interviewing for a job, people might uh, they may not ask you at a job interview stage, but later on in life when you are trying to switch jobs or something, people might ask you what kind of role are you, uh, what kind of role do you prefer? Do you want to run a risk book, or do you want to be in sales? Okay, or do you want to be in operations, etc. So. If you are running a risk book means it's, you are going to be very comfortable with changes in market prices. It's a trading kind of job. Okay. If you are running a risk book means you will be responsible. Okay. So if you are running a risk book here, uh, let's say you are responsible for the market risk on this balance sheet. Okay. If you are being made responsible, that means you are running this risk book now. That means whatever losses happen on this book, that is your problem. Okay. And whatever hedging you have, then you have the freedom to do your, your take your hedge positions to try and offset these losses. But even on that hedge book, if there's any profits and losses, all is attributed to you. All of that is attributed to you. That that's the meaning of saying that you are running this risk book. Okay. And what the, what a risk book typically is? A risk book has market market risk and credit risk. We don't normally think of operational risk as part being part of a risk book. Okay. So uh, typically on a risk book, you have, risk book is basically nothing but a balance sheet. Any balance sheet which has exposure to key risk factors which are basically, uh, which represent market risk. Okay, on this balance sheet, you have all these key risk factors, the gold price, 
the copper price, the spot copper price, the spot prices for gold, copper, oil, forward prices for dollar, yen, Aussie dollars. Okay, so these are all key risk factors which can actually cause losses on this balance sheet. So this is an example of a risk book. Okay, so you'll get a little more familiar with this term, but I'm just using this term. So this is quite widely used in industry to refer to uh, any kind of a, it's like a book, uh, where else we use the book? Just like, I think we've used the expression before once in discussions. But this is what we mean in, in, a, in a finance, in a trading kind of situation, in a treasury capital market situation, if we say risk book means that there is a book, okay, there is a PL, okay? And there's somebody responsible for that PL, okay? So that's why people will ask you, is this the kind of job you want to do? Because they'll be very comfortable with having, having to take losses Okay, market prices will move like what you've seen in your project. That prices move, you don't really, you can't really figure out what is going on. Okay, prices move. You thought that the fundamentals were good, you bought the stock, but it starts falling, then what are you gonna do about it? Okay, are you gonna cut your losses? So these kind of decisions, if you're comfortable dealing with these kind of decisions on a daily basis, then you're comfortable running a risk book. Okay, then obviously you can enjoy the upside also if you make money, all right? So this is what it means. So this is a risk book, that is a term that is used in industry. I've just added a little distinction further on this, okay? Let's just go through the... So all of you guys, the, the, let's say to understand this better, all of you guys when you ran your project accounts, you saw what was happening in your project accounts because every day you had to calculate the NAV, you had to note the NAV every day, so your NAV is changing, okay? So this stuff that is happening to your book, those, all of all of these things, accounts that you were running, these are all risk books, okay? Because you are taking positions, those are losing money or making money, the value of your portfolio is changing every day. So that's what you did in your first NSE trading project, the equity trading project, that's, you were all running risk books, okay? Those are all examples of risk books, okay? So that's what you were doing there. So it's, uh, I think hopefully from this, just to examples, you get an idea. And then here I've written a lot of theory so you might find it confusing, but this is essentially what it is. Okay, so I've distinguished uh, a risk book from a riskless book, okay? Now notice that this, this expression is not normally used in the market. I have only used this riskless expression just to make it, uh, just to make the distinction or mark the distinction between risk books and riskless books, okay? Just to make you understand what is a riskless book so that you can understand what a risk book is better. But don't in the market, don't use this expression riskless book because people don't use the expression, okay? So essentially it's a balance sheet where assets or liabilities don't change easily, uh, frequently in value, okay? So you could actually have a balance sheet, let's say if you have a, like there's a company called Westinghouse Electric which ma manufactures nuclear plants, okay? So maybe, now obviously the value of a nuclear plant does not change on a regular basis unlike the gold price or the oil price. So these are changing almost minute to minute, okay, or second to second. So nuclear plant value also changes, maybe maybe after five, seven years, you feel that that plant is no longer, the technology is old, or you know, so it changes very slowly. So those kind of things we don't consider as risk books. Okay, so the idea behind a risk book is the balance sheet where the assets and liabilities, the value of those assets and liabilities can change very frequently. Where those, uh, you know, the prices are from markets which trade actively like copper, gold, dollar, yen, these kind of things, okay? LME. LME, it could be LME as well. So if you look at Rio Tinto's balance sheet, that will be a risk book because they will have a lot of inventory of metals, aluminum, copper, iron ore, all these kinds of things are fairly actively traded. Iron ore is not that actively, not as actively traded as copper, okay, or oil, but it is still fairly actively traded, so it will be treated as a risk book, okay? Okay, this is what I've said, I've highlighted the key parts and mainly in risk books we are concerned with market risk and credit risk, okay. Now I've made another distinction, okay. Another thing to understand is, what? Active versus passive risk books. Yeah, active versus state passive risk books. Okay, now this is a distinction that I've made just for you to understand this uh, uh, distinction I mean, to, to understand that there are actually qualitative differences. Now think about what you were doing in your first term, uh, in your earlier equity trading project. You started out with a million dollars in cash, okay? So there was no obligation, some of the some of the groups, I just cut marks for Jayant's team. Write down Jayant. Major conversations going on. Okay, 
All right. Um, so in what were you doing? You had a million dollars in cash. Now nobody was penalized if they did not start trading on day one. Some teams waited for a while. Some teams started trading immediately. Okay. So that's your discretion. You may feel that if I don't have a good trading idea right now, I'll just wait and watch the market. Okay. So this is basically when you start out. Now this is an example of so the book that you were running. Do you think it was a speculator's book or a hedger's book? The so speculator's book because your first transaction will increase the risk because you started with one million dollars in your bank in your brokerage account. There is no risk in that position. There is no risk because you just have one million dollars lying in cash that cannot change in value. Dollars to dollars, cash cannot change in value. So that's not a risk book. So you started with another way of looking at the speculators, the definition of a speculator. Another way of looking at that idea is that you start with a book which has no risk. Because you start with a pool of funds and there's no risk in that. Okay. If you don't do a currency conversion, then uh, if you do like if you gather money from Japanese investors and then convert that money into dollars, then of course you have created a currency position. But if you are on the local currency, then there's no risk to start with. Okay, but then immediately you started trading. You buy, start buying and selling stocks. Now you create risk positions. Okay, so now you can lose money. Now your balance sheet can fluctuate in value. That's what you saw happening in your NAV, right? So that's an active risk book, where essentially an active risk book is one run by a speculator. Okay. So okay, it just cut marks for Nagpal also. I don't know why Nagpal and both Nagpal and Ayush are grinning away constantly. Okay, just cut for Nagpal as well. Why don't you sit separately? All you guys, every day you guys lose marks. You go and sit separately, sit next to someone you don't like, so you'll never talk to them. So that then you can at least save marks for your team. Okay. So the term that we are introducing, okay, which is not used in the market, but you can make it's important to understand the distinction that there are two types of risk books. There are active risk books and passive risk books. Active risk books are run by speculators. Okay, so there is a qualitative difference. That's why I've introduced this terminology to highlight this difference. That in a case, what you did in the in your NSC trading project, you started with a book which had no risk, just a million dollars in cash. Then you actively took some decisions, okay, to buy and sell some stocks, and that's why you started creating risk positions. So this is an active risk book which is run by a speculator. It starts with no risk and then it starts increasing its risk. Okay, is this clear? Okay. Now we have a second category, which is the passive risk book. I've actually started defining passive risk books in the notes first, but anyway, in our discussion. So passive risk book is what you see in the case of this Magma Resources balance sheet. Okay. Now this company is not in the business actually of, I don't know if you've heard this idea before in m and Have you heard this idea that you're trying to, the main reason for operating companies is to basically extract the efficiencies from the value chain. Yes. All these ideas yes. you've heard. Yes. Okay. So there is a there is an important train of thought which is I think a fairly reasonable uh, view that let's say a commodity a commodity company a mining company like a resources company like Rio Tinto okay or what we have shown here in Magma Resources they are not in the business of speculating on commodity prices okay if you wanted to speculate on commodity prices there's an easier way to do it open an account with Oanda or Team IB and trade in futures it's much simpler you don't have to go and open a mine in Peru and deal with all the union problems. And all these other problems, there'll be some strike in some port somewhere, then you can't ship out your copper cathodes. Okay, all kinds of headaches that you have to deal with when you're actually running a business, right? Why bother with all that? If you just want to spe speculate on copper prices, just open a futures trading account and buy and sell. It's so much simpler, right? Much more efficient. Are you following the logic? So those companies which are in businesses of like this, like this Magma Resources, which is in the business of mining all these commodities or exploring and uh, you know, refine, exploring oil, okay, exploration and production, exploring and producing oil. So these kinds of uh, companies, they are not actually in the business of uh, speculating on these commodity prices because that can be done much better, much more efficiently by just opening a commodity trading account. What their business is, they are just trying to extract the efficiencies in the value chain. That is, you go open up. How do you deal with uh, the Peruvian government? Okay, Op opening up, get permissions to. Run. I, I should have said Chile, not Peru. Okay, so Chile is the world's biggest uh, uh, copper producer. Okay, there's a company there called Codelco, which is the world's biggest copper producer. That's a Chilean copper company. So, um, so what you do is this is what is this is what the expertise is of a mining company. They know how to deal with the government, get the environmental permits, open the mine 
run the mine, extract the copper, then deal with the unions and all the labor problems and shipment and this and that. So this is why they are in that business. They are not in the business of speculating on copper prices. Okay. So they really don't want to be speculating on copper prices. So here, this is what we say. This is an example of a passive risk book. Because, but at the same time, although they are not interested in speculating on copper prices, what are they talking about here? Okay. So we know now that Magma Resources, as a mining natural resources company, not interested in speculating on copper prices. But are they exposed to copper prices? Yes, yes. yes. They are exposed to copper prices. So what is happening in this case is, by virtue of the business they are in, by virtue of the business that they are in, they end up being exposed to copper prices, uh, risk of copper price movements, okay, or adverse copper price movements. Okay, so this is the idea in a passive risk book. You see how it is qualitatively different from a passive active risk book? Because nobody told you to go and speculate on NSE stock prices. You could have just coolly taken that a million dollars and put it in a uh, bank FD and earned that interest risk free. No bank, no market risk on FD because the interest rate is told to you beforehand. You know that you are getting 9% for one year. You could have just taken that million dollars and put it in the bank fixed deposit and just went, went and got on holiday. But what did you choose to do? You chose to take that book which had no risk and you started buying and selling uh, NSE stocks and thereby creating risk on your portfolio. So that's an active risk book. Okay. So that's a speculator's active risk book. And what is happening in the case of Magma Resources? They don't want to be speculating on copper prices, but they think that they are very good at mining and selling copper, physical copper, okay, and dealing with all the associated problems. So, but because they are in the business of mining copper and copper prices move very frequently, okay, and what the prices at which they are going to sell their copper to their customers, those are going to be determined by copper futures prices on international markets, okay. So, those customers are going to refer to those futures prices on international markets and agree to buy and sell at those prices. So therefore, by virtue of the business that they have chosen to be in, okay, by virtue of that business, they end up being exposed to market risk. This is clear, market risk and credit risk. So by virtue of the business they are exposed, so that's why we call this a passive risk book. So can you see a difference between quantitative difference between active risk books and passive risk books? So that's why I brought out this distinction. So when you're discussing this idea in, in the market with someone, you have to explain the distinction also, okay? Because they will not be familiar with these terms. But you can explain that there is a qualitative difference between a hedger and a directly exposed. Yeah, you can say that also, directly or indirectly exposed. But you have to explain that further, okay? So a passive risk book is basically that which belongs to hedgers, okay? A hedger basically will have a passive risk book. Is this clear? Okay, this is all basically that is mentioned in your notes here. So all this stuff you can read, I already explained this. So there's a lot of writing here, that's because I want to make sure that whoever is reading it, if he's understanding it only from this writing, he should be able to understand it clearly, okay? So all this material has already been explored, now you read it. If you don't understand something, then you ask me. Okay, so I've already, again I've compared one previous uh, unit of learning that you had, one previous module. What are the types of players in financial markets? These are all topics. Remember guys, for your interviews, these are all topics. So you remember little modular topics. So one of the things, this is a very small topic actually. So what did, we, what did you learn about? We learned about different types of players in markets and what are their characteristics. This is also a topic, okay? So this is all these things that you have to remember. You have to be ready with your topics. And if they ask you this question, if they give you a penalty kick in the interview, then you should be able to score the goal, right? Okay. So uh, this is the difference that hedgers have run as passive risk books and market makers and these guys run <coughs> active risk books. Yes, people are getting restless. Is it already near time? Yes. But uh, Aryan Salam has not gone off. So don't worry. Sorry? One minute. I don't know you anything. Okay, so the question that Tushar, you asked a question about those option price strategies. What I suggest you do is read that CME booklet. Remember in the previous course I've given you a folder a finance reference. In that, there is a booklet from the CME, 25 option strategies. If you read that booklet, then you can understand the article a little better. I don't want to discuss it right now because that is option trading that will interrupt the flow of what I'm covering, okay? But if you read that, you'll understand. So we'll wait for Arihan Salam.
Oh, there's a lot of time. <laughs> okay, we have to cover a lot of material because there's a huge amount of material to be covered and I'm afraid again we will not have time to cover all this. There's so much material to be, actually we need about five to six courses. Instead of that we are doing three. Okay, so this stuff I'm not covering because we already understood this now, okay? UP, UE, you already know what it is. What have I said here about passive? Okay, all that has been discussed already, how to figure out what the underlying position is, key risk factors, okay. Now here we are answering the first question in the case as well, okay? Yeah, so if you go back to the question, the, the first question in the case lies what are the key risk factors okay the key risk factors are just nothing but specific uh, prices of uh, market instrument combination you know specific market prices that you refer to which are the source of risk for that book okay what are the, what are the sources of risk for this balance sheet okay the, those those specific risks from this balance sheet they arise from the gold price okay from being exposed to the gold price the copper price the oil price so on this on this balance sheet you say what are the key risk factors here you say the spot gold price okay the spot copper price oil price spot oil price okay then you say forward dollar yen exchange rate okay then uh, aussie dollar for forward aussie dollar exchange rate then uh, here you say three month us dollar LIBOR. okay these are the key risk factors why do we say key risk factors because so this is the first thing you do when you're looking at a balance sheet when you're analyzing a balance sheet okay to understand the risks on that balance sheet this is the framework that you apply first you identify all the key risk factors okay if you saw that this company had uh, aluminium inventory as well then aluminium prices would also be added as a key risk factor okay so this is how it would so this is all that it means so we are just learning some terms okay these are specific terms that you can use that and what this means obviously is that these are the factors that drive the risk of this balance sheet so that's what it means and then key risk factor market is just a, uh, just another term which is when you say gold is a key gold price is a key risk factor then you say the international spot gold market okay which is an OTC market that's the key risk factor market that's the market that you have to follow the key risk factor market is the market that you have to follow in order to form your views and then take hedging decisions yeah how can we take this on this spot market or no, that will be given. That information will be given in the case. This question is how can we deduce from this balance sheet whether it, it, it will be a spot market or forward market? That information will be given in the case. Like what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite the case to remove the problem of uh, interest because we have said that I've said on, on in row number four I said ignore liabilities represented by future interest outflows. I might actually remove that and then I'll make these two zero coupon bonds. These yen loan and the Aussie loan, they will be zero coupon bonds, so there's no interest liability. There's a bullet repayment of principal at the end. Okay, at five years, at after five years. So you're just looking at a lump, a lump sum principal payment, okay, at the end of five years in yen of one and a half billion yen, and then uh, in Aussie dollars of 20 million Aussie dollars. Okay, that's the amount that you paid. Obviously, so the disbursement that you got is much less. Okay, so let's quickly go through the notes. So these are, this is what is meant by the key risk factor market. Okay, which is the market that you have to track in order to uh, manage your risk. Okay, this is also answered, this is also being discussed with you guys, hedge transaction, hedge position. You have to be very careful, like what we saw in the CP performance today, very sloppy use of language. Discussing commodity markets and using expressions like yield curve. This is not acceptable, okay? So very particular use of language, transaction means purchase and sale. Position means long or short. Position can be only long or short. Okay, be particular about. Although in industry you will find that people are not that particular about the use of words, but that doesn't mean that you should also be sloppy. You should, uh, for your own conceptual clarity, you should maintain good habits. Right. What does it say here?
Okay, this part here, what it's talking about is, don't look at your watches, the alarm will go off, don't worry. Here, what is it talking about? It's just reinforcing the idea is, the idea, idea of offset. Here, what does it say here? Offset. That the hedge position should be, the hedge transaction should be such that the hedge position will offset the underlying position. Okay, so whenever you think of hedge positions or hedging, think of offsets. Hedging is another term, especially in India, you see people are using hedging left, right and center, you know, loosely using all these terms. So, uh, be very careful about what exactly hedging is. Let's see if there's anything else. Uh, okay, this is just showing you how the hedge position will neutralize the movement, the net uh, effect on the portfolio, okay? So the hedge position will show the exact opposite performance of the underlying position. So, it will offset and then it will neutralize the effect on the portfolio. Okay, another thing to note out, note this. Remember what we showed you, those two terminal levels at Changi, yes. level 1 and level 2. So, so hedge position parallel. hedge position and underlying position are running as parallel. The hedge position is like sitting on top of the underlying position. So, when you close out the hedge underlying position, that is not hedging. Okay, if your underlying position in crude oil, instead of having 1 million barrels, maybe you make a sale of half a million barrels to a customer. So your underlying position has already gone down by half a million barrels. Now what you say is you have closed out half a million barrels of the underlying position. You do not say that you have hedged. Is this clear? Again, important to be careful about the use of term. People use all the hedging and all very casually used here and there. Do not use words casually. Terms have specific meanings. So if you sell underlying, if you sell the physical oil, half a million dollar, half a million barrels, you have closed out the position to the extent of half a million barrels. You have not hedged it. Okay, hedging means you have that two level setup. You have a parallel book running. Okay? Sorry? Selling the barrels is quite a position. Hedging no no hedging the what? selling those barrels half a million barrels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you sell the physical underlying position, that is called squaring the position. Okay. That is called squaring the position. Why are you standing up, Giri? Sit down. When the alarm goes up, then only you stand up. <laughs> Next time you do that, I'll deduct marks for your team. You, the class is over only when I declare that it's over. Okay. All right. Last, last paragraph here. Remember what we refer to as basis risk. Yes, sir. Okay. When the airline has underlying exposure in jet fuel, but chooses to hedge in crude oil using crude oil futures. So they they haven't eliminated their entire risk. They have eliminated their outright position risk in jet fuel, but they have ended up with spread position risk or a differential position risk. Okay, that's your alarm. Okay, okay, now you can go. I thought that was somebody's phone ringing. <laughs> Jayant, I wishes to add Nagpal from Akhtar. One minute, one minute. Nagpal is Akhtar's group. Minus eight. Okay. Um, Jayant is Ayushi. Ayushi. Please check that. Minus four. Yes. Okay, only these two. <laughs> Who else had a question? Anybody else with a question? Dusha's question I've already answered. Who else had a question? Nobody else had no other question. So you read that booklet first. This article today in the morning. Yeah, yeah, but you read that CME booklet. First. And uh, yeah, okay, yeah. What is the problem? Sir, but when you see the no, that I've, I've, I've made the, i closed that file now, that 12th of September or 12th or whatever it was. What? Yours is not adjusted. Sir, I can't tell you. 
that's fine and all. But that's okay, no, you don't have an A. That formula counts only A. Orange color because uh, they were not physically present. <laughs> It doesn't matter. It is not going to affect your score. No. Your score is affected only when you have A. If you want some other color, I'll give you some other color. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay, is it possible to know the marks for the intern that we had for the IPM? Yes. You still haven't got the marks? Uh, sir, we have only got the final grade. Oh, you want a breakdown? Okay, I'll give you the breakdown. I'll send you the breakdown. Okay. Now that Lalita has given you the marks, no? Yeah, show has mailed us the, the e e end result. No. So now I can give you the breakdown because they didn't want me to release the breakdown earlier okay. or the grades earlier. Okay, I'll send it to you. I'll just place it in your drive, in your folder, in the IPM folder. Oh, new marks for HR Conclave. Okay, I have to check that. I have to check that. Because my grades, uh, that message came. Are, are you sure? Arihat, that message came. Are you sure you want to shut down? Yes, no. No, you have to press second from left. Top left. Second from left. Then you'll get. Uh, now you press enter. Now press enter. And now it's done. Okay. Uh, where should I keep this? I'll just keep it there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, guys, I hope you're not having lunch here. Double A. I hope you're not having lunch here. You should don't eat here. Okay, you can hang around for a while till Rajesh closes it.